My phone's here, so it might ring. At its most basic, it's the state trying to combat the unaffordability crisis. This is our uh, Achilles heel. Florida became the 15th largest economy in the world. We are on track to become the 10th largest economy by 2030. The only thing that's gonna prevent that from happening is this affordability problem. We're not gonna do that. Oh, so right now I just got text. This is like no joke. All right, Anthony, uh, such a pleasure to have you here on the chat. Anthony is an equity partner at Bills and Sunberg. They're one of the biggest real estate law practices across the state of Florida. Anthony uh, is someone that we've, we lean on a lot for information uh, about all things law. And I think today I'm very fortunate to have him here to talk about everything Live Local Act. Anthony, thank you for being here. Uh, absolutely excited to be here with you, Omar. Uh, my favorite topic <laughs> to discuss uh, Live Local Act. Uh, uh, every day is something new right now with it. It's been nonstop since the bill was passed, uh, actually became in law uh, in the middle of summer last year. So I think it's uh, probably, so I've been practicing law for almost, uh, so a little over 20 years, and it's definitely the most exciting uh, change in the law that I've seen yeah. uh, occur. And just so you guys get an understanding of how timely this information is, this whole podcast came about within the last 24 hours. He's like, something's happening within the Live Local Act. Let's chat about it. It's going to be timely. So we are sort of on the fly here to talk about it, but you're probably one of the best experts in Florida well, I mean, right my, now. My phone's here, so it might it might ring. Uh, I'm getting texts. I got a text that was like, whoa, dot, 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 dot. And I got a screenshot of <laughs> you're the new taking bill. Notes. I'm getting calls. It's, it's just, it's nonstop. The bill... The bill right now, the bill right now is in committee today, but we'll we'll talk about that. So let's go high level. Let's zoom out. Uh, what is a Live Local Act? What is like Florida trying to do here? Sure, uh, Live Local Act is is what's referred to as a, a a law that's a preemption of local jurisdictions, and so preemption is something where let's and I've used it before in the past. Let's say you have an issue, and and you got to let me just back up a second. You have to understand there are almost I believe five hundred different municipal jurisdictions in the entire state of Florida. In the Tri-County area, Miami-Dade, Broward, Palm Beach counties, there are over 100. Miami-Dade County alone, there are you know, 35, 36, depends, literally depends on the day of the week. Some of them are as big as Miami-Dade County, which is the largest in the entire state. And then some are as small as uh, my high school, probably, or uh, smaller and only encompass 10 or, or 12 city blocks. These are jurisdi jurisdictions. These are, these, are, these are small municipal uh, jurisdictions. So you can imagine when you have a client that has uh, projects or, or has a business in multiple different jurisdictions just along, uh, just along the, the lines of Miami Dade County, you can get interpretations on that impact your business from 30 something different um, groups of uh, lawmakers. So it becomes impossible and it becomes a little bit of whack-a-mole. Um, and after you go to your third or fourth jurisdiction and, you know, there are different um, municipal groups and municipal attorneys that talk and, you know, and, and so different things uh, uh, get brought up and then they get picked up by other jurisdictions as, as they, they progress. And so in certain instances like that, we'll go to Tallahassee and say, look, we need, we need some assistance here. We need some standardization of the law or we need you to step in and, and, and deal with this regulation here because it's really counterproductive to business and it's leading, it's, it's leading to a lack of predictability. And we need people to understand when they invest in Florida that, they, that there are certain parameters that we can abide by. And so we'll go, to, we'll go to the state and say, we need your help on this preemption. They'll create a law that says, this is how this law will work and this, the, 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 the right to regulate on this particular issue will be retained by uh, the state of Florida and then the local jurisdictions have to follow uh, that law. So the Live Local Act is born of, of that particular um, preemptive um, uh, law. And so in this instance, it was an issue of just incredible importance statewide. Uh, I'm sure this is not news to anybody, but the city of Miami has been consistently ranked as the least affordable uh, MSA in the entire United States. Um, obviously a problem. And so with an unprecedented problem, they got together to create a, um, I guess you can call an unprecedented solution and create a very powerful tool that is specific to different jurisdictions. It still respects the specific jurisdictions, um, but at the same time is preemptive in the sense of saying this, these are the rules in the sandbox that you guys are going to operate in 
going forward because this is such a, a huge issue for us. Right. So basically, at its most basic, it's the state trying to combat the unaffordability crisis. Yes. It, 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 I basically, from their level of the state, creating parameters on how projects that qualify that have an affordable housing component, how they will be regulated. And let's be honest, if you're in the real estate world, you know that NIMBYism is alive and well. Mm -hmm. There's another acronym called BANANA. You can look up that one. I, I forget the exact uh, acronym, but it's like don't build anything anywhere, uh, near, not near anybody. Uh, and which is beyond NIMBYism. And, and, and so, you know, not to get too, too, too down the rabbit hole on this, but COVID didn't help. COVID really uh, politically in the, you know, national picture or even locally really segmented people on uh, opposite sides. There's a lot less opportunity for productive discourse in the middle. And that happens also in the development environment. When you want to reach out to neighbors and you want to talk to them about what the opportunities are, um, you know, you'll have, you know, I've had projects where neighbors will come and support the support what we're trying to accomplish. And, and for the most part, those are the younger families, people that want vibrancy, people understand they're committed to this, to their, their local community for the next, you know, 20, 30 years when they're, and the, the big thing we always talk about is when your kids go to college, are they going to come back to this town? And it could be a small town. And they'll say, I don't know. That's what I'm trying to do to make sure they come back to this town. And so we're trying to keep it vibrant, keep it relevant. Um, and affordable. And, and <laughs> absolutely. And that's the last part of it is, um, is affordable. But in, in that, that process, and there's this app, I don't want to mention it. There is an, um, a, like a social media type app that neighbors organize with. And you'll get people that want to support your project. Immediately, they'll be removed from the app by the administrator because the administrators are never supportive of the projects. So you have this perfect storm with technology and, and COVID and the affordability crisis that we have. And legislators took the opportunity to say, we need to step in and we need to understand this is an issue of statewide concern. Um, we have had incredible success, but along with success and growth within a short period of time, it really strains your infrastructure. And obviously in this case, we're talking about housing affordability and so this allows us to, to uh, uh, apply a new tool. And, and, and what I do for a living, I'm a, I guess technically I'm a zoning uh, attorney, but I've worn a lot of hats in my 20 years. You know, I've gone through the Great Recession. I started my career as a, um, a transactional attorney doing constru construction financing work. Then all of a sudden I was doing litigation during the downturn. I really liked having a job. So I said, whatever you do, that I can be busy. I will do it. The rest of the transactional guys can sit there and twiddle their thumbs if they want. Picked up litigation. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Picked up litigation. And then once we came out of it, I just saw the value of all these permits that were expiring and development approvals that were expiring during that period of time. And I got to go into the city and, and do a lot of hand-to-hand -hand, um, um, combat, hand-to-hand -hand shaking, a little bit of everything. Uh, and so my philosophy is, you know, you can't just be... Uh, uh, narrowly focus on on the zoning. You have to understand all facets of development. And it's kind of unique with my background. And so I'm just trying to pull levers, pull as many levers as possible for clients. How can we get them some extra units over here? How can we get them some tax savings over here? How can we waive impact fees over here? How can we get uh, expedited plan review? And all that stuff is 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 driven by IRR. And how do we hit that return on cost that the lenders want to see? And that was what I was going to say is like a big reason as to why I'm so excited to, to be having this conversation is like how much experience you have in this space. And now more recently, how much of a spotlight the Live Local Act specifically has received where I'm a land and multifamily sales broker and I cannot be on the phone talking about a piece of land with an owner that doesn't yeah. mention the Live Local Act. And to your point, there's a lot of fact and fiction, which is something that I want to get into here where... One owner, you know, bought this land for five million recently. The Live Local Act passes, and now he's like, "Omar, I sell it for ten million. And I'm like, <laughs> "It doesn't really work that way." And I think a lot of the reasons as to why I know that it doesn't really work that way is because of conversations that we've had. Right. So correct me if I'm wrong. At at the most like fundamental level, 
the state of Florida is basically saying there are some there are some pieces of land, a lot of them, right, which we are going to allow higher density purposes. So whereas before this one acre piece of land, my iPad here used to fit 65 units. Now we're going to allow it to fit, make up a number, 200 units. So somebody could put more units as long as it meets certain AMI requirements Correct. and like affordability Correct. requirements. So I guess let's, let's start there with the specifics and then I'm sure I'll have a ton of questions. No problem. You'll get real time. I'm getting texts right now, so we'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So um, talk to me about, and again, correct me if I'm wrong. There's fun, there's, there's higher upzoning to be had, like density bonuses to be had from the Live Local Act if you meet certain requirements, right? My understanding is that those requirements primarily are like AMI restricted, right? Area median income. Yeah, I mean, I'll jump into it. They're really, they're really three buckets. And I think people are, for the most part, focusing on the zoning bucket because of some outlier um, projects. And I w- you know, I'll preface it by saying, I don't condone leveraging a Live Local Act as a threat against local jurisdictions, okay? Because that can obviously, yeah, I think that can backfire you. It takes you know, my reputation, I build it day by day by day. The reputation that I have is built off of working every day for the last 20 years. And as many days as there are in 20 years of my reputation, I can destroy it in one day or in five minutes in one application. This is a, a very small town. A way in which you can thread in a jurisdiction with the Live Local Act is basically saying this decision is now a state's decision and the city right? What the state is saying is, hey, you're going to be able to, we'll allow you to build more in this particular jurisdiction that you're at, and we'll give you tax savings in your development. So if I'm understanding this correctly, the city of whatever it may be is like, I'm getting, you know, more density in my neighborhood and getting less tax as a result. And both those decisions are going, are being circumvented to the state level from me. Well, the, the way I would put it is, um, when I say don't use it as a, a, a threat, it means I really want uh, X, but I'm going to threaten to live lo- local projects so I can get X. I, I don't, I and don't, what are reasons why the cities and jurisdictions might not want to live local? Why, why could it be a threat is my problem. Well, look, I, I, think, I, think, I think that there's some myth busting that has to be done. We've spent a lot of time on education on the front end with the original bill. Uh, last year was Senate Bill 102. This year it's Senate Bill 328. <clears throat> um, enhancing um, what was passed last year. And, and when I say enhancing, meaning uh, passing portions that will allow them to realize the legislative intent they had in SB 102 and also include specifically protections for single family residents. And I think that was the, the big concern. But, but I, I think it's a, a lot of myth busting and uh, I'm getting around the water cooler to talk with municipalities saying, look, it, it sounds like this this big scary thing, but let's look at it for what it is. Let's see where the uh, friction points are between your local law, your local code, and what the Live Local Act is. And what we find is when we apply it on a citywide basis, there are actually much fewer points of concern for the jurisdiction. We've done this exercise now with uh, over a dozen uh, different municipalities. And th- what we found is that the areas of concern, I mean, if you have this like Venn diagram that kind of overlaps the code and the, and the Live Local um, Act are, are really in areas where for some reason the code doesn't have a buffer around single family areas, uh, single family zoned areas. And so in those instances, you know, we learned from that and, and now going back to Tallahassee, they specifically dealt with it from a massing and height standpoint. And, and they create some additional protections we can get into for the single family residents um, in particular. But, you know, for the most part, I, I think it, it's fear of the unknown in what this could be. Um, some people, uh, I would say the phrase, uh, those people, we don't want those people in our neighborhood. That is a phrase that I was shocked when I first heard it many years ago. And the funny thing is it comes from neighbors who were those people one generation ago, uh, I can definitely speak, you know, from, from my generation, those were my parents and my grandparents that immigrated to the United States. I mean, and then their own children or grandchildren are the ones that don't want those people. 
And that's kind of really hard to, to swallow in a, in a city like Miami. Um, and, then it, and then it really comes down to the issue of, of scale, right? Is something going to be out of scale or not? And that's where you kind of, I can't, I'm not going to get into the psychological back and forth about the American dream. And, you know, everybody wants three things in this country. They want uh, uh, good schools. They want a place to worship God, whoever their God might be. And they want to be able to afford where they live. Okay. But, you know, if I want to get out my soapbox for a second, that American dream cannot stop at your threshold. And it doesn't apply just right, to just you. Just okay? you want it. <laughs> right. Um, I've got my American dream song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, no, exactly. No. It's like you pull the ladder up as soon as you get to the next uh, right, uh, right, level. Right. And, and so <laughs> yeah. you, you, you're, you're dealing with, with that. But, you know, that, that's that whole those people thing. And it's, yeah, yeah. And it's very sad and unfortunate to see as, a, as a, you know, the first person born in the United States in my family. Um, it's very difficult to kind of swallow, but having understood it now for so many years. And the issue of massing, we, we, we go through the code and we show them, okay, well, where are the real friction points? Then we went back to Tallahassee and fixed it. But, but I really don't think it, once you educate and you don't like do the whole ostrich thing and, and even the most adamant, ardent, um, and there aren't that many out there, I can count in my hand, um, the ones that have I mean, really- I once you talk to people and sit them down of like the net positives, some negatives, typically everyone gets around to the fact that this is a big net positive to the state of Florida. They're so We're tackling unaffordability no, head on. A hundred percent. So we went to the Florida Housing Coalition Conference last year where Florida Housing puts it on um, and we have, you know, staff from and elected officials from tons of municipalities across the state. And so I spoke in a panel there with uh, Nathan Kogan at the time was the zoning director of uh, administrator of Miami-Dade County and then directors from various counties throughout the state on how to implement uh, workforce housing programs locally in combination with, <clears throat> with the uh, Live Local Act. Staff across the board was very excited about SB 102 because it set, let them separate the politics of the public hearing or the minority overly vocal voice and let them separate that from their professional job. Because staff, it's not like you can just show up and do whatever you want. Staff, these people have uh, uh, advanced graduate degrees in planning, know the code back and forth. They follow the law and they will approve or deny your project based on the actual black and white law. Where the law gets deviated from is when the public puts pressure on the elected officials and you have a recommendation from staff. The professional staff has reviewed it and said, this follows all our law, all our planning guidelines, and this is in line. But then there's a, a minority that pushes back against it. And they're essentially, there's a, there's a current there where they're saying, and I would say that this could, this could easily apply in any instance where they're saying, we don't want to follow the law. We know what the law says. We know the professional staff approved it, but I don't care. I, I, I want to, I, I have my own version of, of what I want. And they apply a lot of pressure, especially when talking about smaller jurisdictions. Imagine some jurisdictions only have, you know, 2,500, 3,000 residents. And, um, you know, I, I don't, I don't mean this in a derogatory way, but from a size standpoint, it's so cool from a student council in a high school, right? And, you know, you see these people all the time, every single day, the amount of pressure they can put on you, not just in that public meeting, but when you see them at simply at the grocery store down the block or at a, you know, social gathering on the weekends, it, it is very tough. And, and I'll, and, and to kind of put a pin in it and an antidote I'll give you. So through uh, ULI, the Urban Land Institute, we do uh, a lot of uh, workshops for municipalities, especially municipalities that get that if they don't plan for 20 or 30 years from now, they will not have a city or 20. Their, their tax base will be eroded. Children will not come back after college. And it's, 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 uh, um, uh, it turns into a very short road for the progression of the jurisdiction. So we have these workshops and we had the same conversation we're having right now. And somebody asked me, you know, how, how I felt about it. And I said, well, people are pushing you at, to not follow the law as per your professional staff. And I would say in some instances, that pushing gets really aggressive and they're bullying. And this, because they start bullying you elected officials to not follow the law. And I've, I've never gotten a standing ovation before from any public officials or elected officials in my life. I got two rounds <laughs> of, standing of standing ovation in this ULI workshop. And I think that 
that that you know they struck a nerve in that comment because they do feel like they're being forced not to follow the law. And so to, to your original question, the Live Local Act allows staff to do professionally what they were supposed to do. And so that you do have to do an administrative approval still. It's not like you can do whatever you want. You do still have to follow their local land development regulations, which are their setbacks, step backs, um, certain other parameters are not preempted, but it gets reviewed professionally by staff. Okay. And it's an administrative approval. So there's no more um, public hearing where there's that opportunity for deviating from the law as recommended by staff um, and maybe pushing and pushing too hard where it gets into the world of bullying. That being said, I don't want to take away from the fact that, um, you know, they're, they're, I don't want to say that that's 100% what happens, but those are the things that we're concerned with, especially when you're weighing it against the affordability component and the importance of it, and that it's not just about massing and the size of the project and the use. It becomes about those people. And that's my, my, one of the reasons why I work so hard um, on this particular um, niche of our world, because I just constantly think that those people were my grandfather, those people were my dad and my mom, you know, and I was born in a duplex uh, in, uh, in Little Havana next to the dog track. Okay. And, you know, you, you can't like pretend that, that, that those people don't exist. And those people are firefighters, police officers, um, you know, nurses, my wife's a nurse. And just bef before I want to make a clear point, people tell me all the time, that's not affordable housing. That 120 AMI, which is the band. Yeah, I want to talk about that. And I go, I go, no, it's simple. I, 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 I love to talk about it because I go, okay, so if you have two people that live in a one bedroom, the bands that they can make of income a piece are $34,000 a piece up to $54,000. $4,000 a piece. So when you have a couple each making $33,000, $34,000 a piece, if you don't think that's affordable, then we're just, different world. We're, we're not, we're talking about Miami here or a lot of other MSAs in the state of Florida up to $54,000 a piece. Once you, once you go past that 54 in a couple, you're, you're going past the band. Yeah. And, and so people just don't, there's this, there's this, there's this um, kind of friction between uh, you know, those people comments because they think about um, concentrated um, public housing that really are ultra low or really low income. And, you know, I think we've learned that concentrated poverty at that scale and at those levels is probably not the best solution for the problem. Um, and, and these people are, are, are as I said, people uh, in, in those bands, hospitality, valets, uh, restaurant workers, um, a complete different scenario. And then the bill allows really what I love are mixed income opportunities. And so you don't have, when you have people that are blue collar mixed in and getting amenities that, I mean, I'm doing a project right now. It's a condo product. They would never think doing them Wynwood. Uh, I have no fear in saying that because the city of Miami is, is very fair about the live local act. <clears throat> it's a product in Wynwood. We're doing a condo product, high end amenities, and we're going to have a workforce component to it that helps the building qualify for the Live Local Act. So why is it called the Live Local Act? Because they can live locally next to the best opportunities for employment, work, live, play. Boom. Insert that definition. Be perfect. If you looked it up in the dictionary, it would be Wynwood, right? So they get to live in Wynwood. And they get to be in a building that's amenitized to the level of a condominium. I went, I toured a client's project recently that's a workforce project and I, to your point, I was blown away. It was, it was condo quality project. I mean, I live in a building that's 12 years old in Brickell and I'm like, my, my condo doesn't look this good. Like, this is amazing, right? You might, might have to upgrade. You might have to upgrade. <laughs> yeah. Especially for, for, you know, the, the rental amounts that they're asking for and the amenities that they're giving. Yeah. You know, and, and it us. all, look, it all comes down to, uh, uh, I, this thing doesn't exist in a vacuum. And I want, I don't want to get into the details, but I think people don't understand before they get into it <clears throat> that it can work in every product type. It can work in water. I mean, I got a client from New York that are looking to implement this in a particular business model they have for waterfront condos to mix in uh, a workforce um, component all the way down to your traditional workforce housing areas 
They're going to be, um, you know, west in the county or areas of Miami like Alapata. Hard to find, but. And I think a lot of our clients, right, many that we share, I mean, they're, they're numbers guys, right? They want to build something that makes sense. They want to build something that makes a community more vibrant. But at the end of the day, the numbers need to pencil. And if you are getting incentivized to add workforce housing units that are under a percentage of AMI, and that's value accretive to your development, I see it as a win-win, right? And I know there's a million ways to skin it and different ways to look at it, but I think at the end of the day, it comes back to like education and, and educating everyone, you know, from, from the people to the people involved to the developers on like, how is it value accretive? How, how does it apply? And what's it gonna mean to your jurisdiction? So let's, I guess right now, just start with SB 102 and SB 328 or just yeah, 328. Sure, sure, sure. What are, and you don't have to dive super deep into them now, but high level, what's the difference between the two numbers? I've heard about SB 102 so, a lot more. Yeah, sure. So, you know, in Tallahassee, uh, when you get a Senate bill, they, they number it. And so ultimately the Senate bill uh, 102 and I'm, a, I'm on the board of governors of the Florida chamber. And so we get to preview a lot of this legislation while it's going through the different houses uh, d doing during the different committees in the Senate and different committees um, in the House and wherever it starts, it, it keeps that that name. So it's an SB because it started in the Senate. And so um, the funny thing is, I get the first draft of this thing, and I just give it to my affordable housing team because we have like in my department, there's a whole group of guys that just and, and girls that just do uh, affordable housing, and it's it's kind of like two sides of the same coin, but it, it's it's a very unique subset of law that they do, very specialized. And they give it back to me and they go, they go, you need to look at this. And I go, no, it says affordable housing. No, 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 no. It goes to 120 AMI. That's workforce. And I go, hold on a second. After the 10th or 12th time that I read it, I at least started to understand a little bit about it. So what's 120 AMI when somebody says that? So what does it mean? 120 AMI on the zoning side um, is, uh, so every county, and, and it, so HUD and the federal levels puts these numbers out. And then the state of Florida, Florida Housing publishes um, these rent limits by county. And so there'll be a, a, a rent limit at different numbers, 140, 120, 180, da, 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 all the way on down. Uh, not 100, actually, it goes 120, 80 uh, in every county, and it's countywide. So Miami has a number, Broward has a number, Pasco has a number. What's AMI stand for? Area median income. Okay, and like, give me an example. It doesn't have to be so, specific, but what's in Miami Dade, what's the number? So like? a studio, a studio in Miami Dade County is 2169. 2169, which means if you're renting a studio at or below $2,169. You qualify for the 120 AMI number. Okay. And then that 120, it's because you are 120% of the area median income, 127, yes. 120% yes. of AMI. Well, Miami gets, Miami, Miami gets a special treatment um, because of how rent restricted we are, but without getting too deep of a dive in it, um, the numbers are published every year. And I think a one bedroom off the top of my head, it's like uh, 23, 23, something like that, about $2,300. And then like a, a two bedroom is uh, somewhere like $2,700. Uh, right. So from, from my perspective on the, you know, selling land and talking to developers, they're basically saying like the guy, a lot of the guys that I'm talking to, they're saying, Hey, you know, I was going to build a project here and my one bedroom was going to be approximately $2,500. Anthony's telling me that if I restrict my rent to $2,300, I'm gonna to qualify to be under 120% of the area median income of the AMI. And if I do that to enough of my units, I'm gonna get a big tax savings that's gonna be value accretive to my project. So my, 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 you know, my clients are basically saying, I could lower my rent by $200 and restrict it. And maybe that over a hundred units is going to cost me, I'm going to make up a number, you know, $200,000. Right. But the tax savings that I'm going to get are going to be a million dollars. Right. I don't know. So it makes sense for me to do this. Is that kind of how, from a number standpoint to look at it? Yeah. I mean, I'll give you anecdotally. So we did a, so there were, at the end of the year, there was a deadline, December 31st, to submit for the tax exemption. There are really three buckets, and I'll, I'll get into them. One is the zoning benefits. Uh, the other one is the tax benefit, and the other ones are financing benefits. So you can also get money, very inexpensive money, um, if you qualify under these programs. Uh, so zoning the, benefits, basically you can build more on this land than you right. could before. Tax benefits, you're going to get 
a tax exemption on your your ad valorem your tax, property tax. Your tax bill would have been a million dollars. It can be reduced to seventy five percent for one twenty AMI or one hundred percent. So not to be two hundred and fifty grand. Uh, whatever yeah. whatever it might be, and then there are also financing opportunities through uh, uh, there, it's an RFA process, it's a request for application, where you can submit, and I'll tell you. This might be the one that is is incredibly impactful because people are focusing on the zoning and the tax, but people aren't really honed in yet on the financing side. So they're they're two different buckets. One is for transformative, uh, uh, affordable workforce housing, and one is for innovative, uh, innovative affordable workforce housing. And um, by way of example, there, there's a hundred million dollar tranche that gets refilled through um, 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 tax deductions that businesses get in the state of Florida. Instead of paying for their Florida corporate income tax, or they'll pay to Florida housing, they'll, they'll get their own tax break in response. Um, so then it, businesses are paying that. And they'll pay into a, that bucket, pool bucket. And that, that bucket will get constantly refilled, periodically refilled, excuse me. So the, the, the $100 million tranche that went out, they had 71 applications for the $100 million tranche. And they How still. Many applications? 71 applications uh-huh. for the $100 million tranche. And they still had a surplus of almost $4 million. And those monies are called sale funds. They're for projects that qualify up to 120% AMI. They have different components that you can get points for, for infill development, for housing, for specifically military, for, I mean, there are a number of different components that you can hit to get you a better chance of getting that money. But ultimately the money is, uh, you know, like 1% amortized over uh, decades and it can fill up to 25% of your uh, construction budget. That's kind of the limit of it. And in a world where lenders used to lend 65% and now they've retreated to about 50, that's a nice space they can come in um, and fill some of that so gap. So those, those, those applications that you mentioned are from developers Correct. that are basically submitting an application that are saying, hey, for these reasons, you should give me some of that some of the $100 million in that bucket that you're raising. Correct. So, so the we'll state put, of Florida, is that who's got that for bucket? Statewide, or? statewide. And so we'll... We'll help them. We'll help them understand what the requirements are. Um, there are a lot of. This is not just what's in the code uh, or what's published. There are a ton of workshops with Florida Housing that we have to attend to make sure we're up to speed on um, all the latest issuance of, of Q and A or clarifications that are going on. Um, it's it's kind of a constant process that. Um, uh, you know, we're working on it. Um, in so the what office. you get is when you say 1% amortize over, you know, 30 years or whatever it may be, it's like a funding. So basically, hey, you were going to build a $100 million project. Yeah, I'd say it's 100. Let's just do, yeah. you know, just, uh, just use right number $100 million. I can, in theory, fund $25 million of that through the sale funds. You can yeah. fund $25 million of that. Right. And it'll funds. be at 1% and uh, amortize. You're saying 1% over. as a 1%, rate? 1%, yes, as a rate. Oh, that's that's ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, so yeah, I, I, this is interesting you say that because I haven't heard of this, and I'm in a lot of conversations yeah, about yeah. this. All I've heard is zoning and tax savings. Yeah, and so traditionally, sale funds were only for my affordable, like very narrow, right? Capital A affordable. Yeah, right? big A affordable yeah. stuff. And so, you know, I'm working. In, I think that the beauty of it is I have the infrastructure bills and to to leverage to understand traditionally how these work. And then I help them leverage that gap into how it's being implemented now with the Live Local Act. Because they pulled a lot of that infrastructure on what they had existing already, but it's not 100%. I mean, there's been some uh, intense debates and Q&As on how to interpret different right. components of it. I mean, we've had to go to the, we've had to uh, seek uh, interpretations from the Florida Department of Revenue, from different property appraisers. I mean, this has just been constant. Uh, it's, it's consumed your life. It, 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 it I've known my, Anthony for a while, and since the Live Local Act came on, you're ever you're flying, you're talking. Yeah, it's <laughs> just no. Because look, I, I, I'm telling you, we, and you're passionate about we it. We need so. this. We need this. Right. We need this because I I don't care what your view is, but both sides of the aisle are on board with this. I mean, you, this is not a this is not a governor well, thing. Well, I could personally speak to. I mean, I grew up in Doral, and a lot of my friends and even family members included, like they can't afford where they grew up in, like they, they can't, you know, get out of their parents' house or they can't afford a house. And they're like, I'm thinking about moving Look, you know, out of here. And when I'm you, just like, no. <laughs> when you, when you're, you grew up here in Miami, crazy. let's just use the Miami example. You grew up here in Miami, go away to school, let's say you go to UF, FSU, yeah. where the case might be. After you have that level of freedom, you think you're gonna go back home to live with your parents? 
<laughs> no, it's not going to happen. You want to continue that level of independence, but you want to do it in a place where you can afford and a place that allows for, you know, professional career growth, right? And so I think, and 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 the whole work live play, right? And that's what we sell here in Miami. Right. Yeah, if, the there was a, if there was a postcard, that would be the postcard for Miami lifestyle, yeah. right? Yeah. You want to go to New York, you know what you're signing up for. You're right. signing up for a shoebox, you're getting on a train, you're going to get squashed, you're going to deal with the weather. <laughs> it is what it is. But hopefully your career takes off. <laughs> yeah. I mean, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got you. Exactly. And Before my you... whole thing is, like, again, my friends included, and myself included, when you left Miami to go to college, you were thinking of a $400,000 home, $350,000 home. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's First. now a million dollars or 900 grand once you came back out of college and you're like, what happened here? So yeah. again, we're both very passionate about this. I mean, we're, we're obviously have been in Miami for two, three decades, probably more. And real quick, I don't want to steer away from the, from the meat of the conversation. So what you explained between the zoning, the tax and the financing implications, that's all SB 102 or that includes the 328? So, so all, all, all three of those can come together in a project. It all stems from SB 102 from the bill last year. And, um, you know, that bill's in a vacuum. And then we had to implement it municipality by municipality and then project by project. It really matters the city you're in and it matters the project you have. I even have some sites that are multiple cities, split zoned. Some properties where I, is mixed use industrial commercial, I can apply, I can apply live local to. And another part that I can't imagine, you're, you're really uh, like a mad scientist at that point in time, working with staff and, and going through implementation of it. So imagine all, all that feedback that we get. And we even had to put together a digest. We have a digest of all the municipalities we're working on throughout the state, whether it's Orlando or Tampa or um, you know all the jurisdictions here in South Florida. And so with that, based on that feedback and also working with the property appraiser's office, because the tax exemption part is really, um, for the most part, run by the property appraisers because the property appraisers are the only um, um, office constitutionally that can actually reduce and do the exemption. Mm, so my involvement started with the Memory County Property Appraisers Office. And, you know, they're fantastic, by the way. We had lots of conversations, um, you know, bleeding into some Friday happy hour times uh, uh, that, that we had to go through all the language. Oh, look at this line. Look at the other line. What does this mean? What do you think that means? And ultimately, you know, they really dedicate a lot of time to the Property Appraisers Office here in Memory County to figuring it out. But what they found was, and this is one of the main differences between 328 and 102 last year is, the tax exemption, when you look at it from an appraisal guideline standpoint, only applied to the unit, to the qualified unit. So what does that mean? That means they didn't count the land and they backed out your common area factor. So for every dollar in theory that you had a property tax, they would back out, I don't know, 10 cents for the land value and another, you know, 35, 30 cents for your common area factor in your project. And you were left with what? 60 cents on the dollar to start with. Mm -hmm. And so we went back to Tallahassee. What well, you're saying to start with like 60% to remove from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The other exactly. ones you're paying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you started with a million dollar tax bill, they backed up the land value and backed up the common area. And you say back that, you're like, hey, these you can't touch. This you can't touch. Like, so then you, you, you went from a million dollars that was eligible to only $600,000 right. that was eligible. And, like, and that, that, that wasn't the legislative intent. But that's, that was the, the law in a vacuum versus how it worked in the real world with their appraisal guidelines. And so working with, this is what I said, you got to work with the people that are implementing so they understand what it is and they, and, and, and they don't, um, that they, they can, you know, they embrace the solution to face the unprecedented problem. And so we, cre we jointly created language that um, was proposed by the property appraiser to the state. And that language was adopted word for word. And now the tax exemption, when it passes, will be exactly as intended, which was you get a tax exemption off your full tax bill, not just the footprint of the unit it, uh, on, on the full dollar. So that's the, one of the biggest changes from SB 328 versus SB um, 102. And that's it. So is SB 328 like a uh, sort of like the new bill that sort of yeah yeah so it, it, like it encompasses all the language from SB 102 and then and then it, and then it, and, and what it is is really an enhancement based on all the different um, projects that we're working on right now. And obviously the taxes are, 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 are an issue that are across the board, irrespective of the particular zoning of a, of, of a project. But I would say, um, uh, so we did, of the 117 applications that were submitted by the end of last year, 
to Florida housing for the tax exemption, we probably submitted close to 20% of those. Myself and um, another- Oh wait, out of all the applications submitted to call it Tallahassee, yeah. your group, the 20%? Probably close to 20%. That is wild. I mean, everyone I was talking to was like, Anthony, 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 Anthony. That's why I'm like, I'm really excited to have you here. Well, uh, well I, I, have, I feel like I have to share this story. I'm gonna, share my, I'm gonna let my wife see this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm with my kids and, and we take a, we took a trip to the Keys for, for New Year's and we ended up going to Key West and I'm there outside of, um, I like, I think Sloppy Joe's, we were going, I like, I think Sloppy Joe's, we were going to all the little tourist stores, you know, clients calling me at the last moment. Well, how many units and the, we're on with the appraiser and the appraiser is giving the interpretation of the market rate study. And there was a question that wasn't resolved in the workshops with Florida housing. So we have to make phone calls to the administrators of the program to get interpretations like literally on the last day that we could submit on December, whatever that Friday was, because the 31st is over a weekend. And, and you know, so, so if you ask my family about this, they could probably give a, a good podcast to you too. At least my, 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 old, my oldest in the car. Yeah. My fifth around. grader, my fifth grader can probably give you a pretty good uh, yeah. um, outline on it. So anyway, 328 taxes, huge difference because the way the taxes work, you do 71 units, um, minimum 71 units, you qualify, then you get 75% off your ad valorem property taxes, now the whole thing, for your 120 AMI units. If a component of those units are 80% AMI, you get 100% off for that proportion of the units. So I can tell you, anecdotally at least from, but it's a decent enough sample set of, the, of all the ones we submitted at the end of the year, our biggest one was close to 700 units, and our smallest one was probably uh, like 90 something units. And every single one of those, the NOI, and this is already passing the tax savings on to the tenant, the NOI moved somewhere like 14 to 16 or 17%. <laughs> That's crazy. Okay, but the tenant got a break. We got something that was worthwhile for us to do that was accretive, um, to the bottom line, right? And now we have all these secondary benefits that the clients are happy about, the owners are happy about, because now they're renting and they're offering a discount compared to the guy next door. So guess who's going to attract the unit first? We're going to attract the unit first. Keep in mind, it's a brand new building also. It had to be within the last five years that UCO'd. They let us go back five years, which is great. Which I want to talk about. And we'll talk about that, but it has to be a new product. It's not just you live in a space and you get these amenities. You're also in brand new product. You're not in 50 year old product. At a better price. At a better price. And the owner slash developer has a bigger profit margin, like, like and, and, more and, NOI. And ultimately you get a stickier tenant. You don't have to push rents as much, constantly pushing rents. Um, people take better care of your, of your property. It does the marketing for you uh, via word of mouth, you know, a lot less vacancy. Um, those are the secondary benefits that also make it worthwhile. I mean, I'll tell you there's, and you know our property taxes here in Miami County are, are significant, but there was one where I think we qualified like two, a little over 200 units in a particular asset, and <clears throat> 70 or 80 of those, or um, at least half of those, uh, some of them qualified on their own. By the way, there are when instances you say, where they just explain to me when you say qualified on their own. So first, you have to say are they 120 percent AMI? Mm -hmm. Which is like they, do we meet under? Are we under this threshold? Right, right. So you, are we under 120 percent AMI? Of for, this jurisdiction. For the county, yeah. for the county, yeah, that county. countywide. Then you say, okay, so then we have to get a market rate study done because it's 120 AMI or 90% of your market rate, the lesser of the two. So you have a bunch of the, they're under 120 AMI. And then you say, okay, are they also under 90% of your market rate? What's a, what's a, what's a market study, market rate, high you, level? What you, does that look like? Well, it looks like um, finding similar product, similar vintage, similar amenities to the extent that you have a higher quality product, they obviously get adjusted, but I rely on specific um, uh, property uh, appraisers, um, certified appraisers, independent certified appraisers to conduct the market rate study for us. Now, they do have to get educated on the scope of the Live Local Act and understand what it is. I basically have um, for them a, a condensed version of all the Q and A's There'll be a lot of follow-up, a lot of education that we do with the- Let me uh, particular. Yeah, ask you a question. So on the 80% or 120% of AMI side, not touching the market rate side now, yeah. let's say it's 
studios are 2100, you know, one bedroom's got to be under 2300, let's say two bedrooms 2800, three bedrooms 3200, just making up numbers, right? Yeah, roughly. So then the market rate side comes in and let's do two examples. One, the market rate study comes in and all the rents are much higher than those limits. Then to qualify, I just need to be under the AMI limits that correct, are lower. Correct, correct, yeah. Let's say those will use And that same- happens, by the way, you'll have your market rate study come back and you can have some instances where the 90% market rate study is actually higher than the 120 AMI. The 120, sorry, the market rate is higher than the 120 AMI. Yeah, because it's the right. lesser of the two, right. what you have to rent. And now there's thing, there's, I'm assuming you've had cases where it's the opposite. Right. Where the limits, the AMI limits that are very set in stone are like up here. A little higher, and then yeah. you do the market rate study of the comps and the comps are under it. Right. I, I would say for the most part, they're, they're very close to each other. And so in any project, you're going to have some that are, um, you know, a couple hundred bucks, a couple hundred bucks over, but I'm just going to give you an example. This, this, this asset that we had, some just automatically qualified the majority of them because they were, they were already renting and it just, it, it depends on the size of your unit, the amenities you have. There are a lot of factors that come into play. And, you know, as an aside, a lot of, a lot of folks have reached out to me now, developers and property owners have reached out now as they're building out their pro formas. We're bringing the um, certified appraiser earlier to do a market rate study now where they're performing out their unit mix because they're saying, okay, I don't want to end up with a unit that's much larger than the market because I'm going to have a really hard time qualifying for this program. And I would tell you the only property we had, we only had two instances of problems with that. One where, where if, the, if the unit was much bigger in your property than the rest of the market, it was hard to make the numbers work. And then in the uh, Space Coast. And this is, this, is, this is hilarious. So you got a bunch of engineers out there. All they care about is the rockets. All they care about are the rockets. These guys are making three or $400,000 a year. And they're renting out like $1,800 a month, one bedroom units. Because there's also an income component you need to comply That's with. That's what I'm going to talk about. But I mean, statewide, it all worked. You, you, were, you were very close to the 120 AMI income restriction. It really wasn't that. It was a secondary issue. And, and it typically kind of fell in line. Except for the space coast, these guys are making three, four hundred thousand dollars a piece. It was, it was, it was crazy. I, I, it just goes to show the engineers really. Uh, so the just, income, the income didn't qual- didn't allow those properties to qualify. Is yeah, because right? there was two X with right. what the income limit was. Right, and that was really the, the so the, the the size of the unit. So we're working now with certified appraisers up front to help them build out the so the, the unit mix, or like in that space coast area. Otherwise. It, it worked out pretty well. And, and I'll just tell you real quick in this Miami Dade County example, you know, the, the property tax per unit was probably like, let's say six or $7,000. And in many instances, they had to reduce the rent to get into that 90% market rate study. So they just bumped the rent down probably like three, $3,000 per unit and they just split it. So they, they, they passed on the savings. They gave $3,000 of saving to the tenant. And they took three thousand dollars of savings for themselves. Yeah, and it was it's a win-win. That's it. Yeah, uh, total win-win. Yeah, and and uh, and then so you take that NOI right, and now we're talking with lenders on new product. You know, we're getting products. Products are approved. We got a administrative site plans. We're almost done with them because obviously it takes some time to revamp a project and get the approvals uh, completed. Architects have to draw plans. It doesn't happen like overnight. Um, but in those instances, we're already talking to lenders. And we're getting them comfortable with it. Now that they're seeing the certifications come out, they're willing to entertain discussions about underwriting um, the tax Future, exemption right. and these performance. Because at the end of the day, I was like, well, isn't the tax number they give you, isn't that an estimate? Isn't the insurance a tax estimate? And they're not pulling them out of their sky. They're, using, they're, they're not coming out of the sky. They're using their consultants. Well, here's the same certified appraiser that's explaining how the tax exemption works. You know, We're drafting um, letters in support of this for the, for the lenders. And, and they are... When you talk about the real number, the green light number, the return on cost number, the spread between that and the exit cap, if you move half a point, you're good to go. Your project's same. moving forward. Yeah. You're blowing the dust off the, off the, off the plans and, and, and you're hitting the green light. Yeah, no, but that, and that's really the stage where we're at right now. So they're willing, some lenders are, you know, we're further along with some than others, but they're willing to underwrite the deal to get to so that they recognize that perform a number maybe they don't want to give you 100 percent of it if it's enough to move the needle and then we do have projects where they've already completed construction they've just stabilized and they're in that construction a perm period where they're going to go refinance 
And when you can throw in an extra million dollars in your NOI, apply that valuation to six cap. Yeah. I mean, you're talking about $20 million, $15 million. $20 million of actual value that you're able to get out. And that's, that's neutral to everybody. Everybody's a win, win, win. And it's not, that's not a tax number. That's a number that they're, so when you're looking at it, you're saying, well, I can just do a product. I don't want to understand this. Fine, don't understand it. But the people that get it and they look at their business model and they say, I really have conviction about this jurisdiction and I really have a conviction about my product. And I go, no problem. I'm, I have conviction about Live Local. I'm going to show you how I can make Live Local for your, work for your product and in that jurisdiction. Let's go talk to the city staff. Let's go work it through. Because at the end of the day, let's reverse engineer it from the $20 million of, of actual cash to be able to cap out tax-free at the end of this deal after you stabilize. I usually reverse engineer from there and all of a yeah. sudden they're very and happy. And they're like, oh yeah, we can talk about this. Oh, yeah. hold on a second. What, what is so, this with again? <laughs> from a lender's perspective, let me uh, try to summarize my understanding of, of what you're saying, right? It's basically, I'm looking to build a project, right? And when I'm going to look for a loan, right? The lender, I'm showing them an, an NOI, a net operating income of $3 million. Pro forma, you're pro yeah, forma. Pro yeah. forma of $3 million, bottom line. And then you're saying, hey, I'm trying to help the lenders get comfortable to underwrite these tax savings to show them that this three million is actually going to be four million. It's really going to be something like uh, just add like fifteen percent to that. You know, probably that an extra, probably, probably like a three point five. Right. Instead of a three, so it'll probably three point five. Three point five. So then the lender is like, hey, instead of you know lending forty million dollars for this, I'll be able to lend fifty million dollars for this because the, the profitability is that much greater for this asset, right? I mean, yeah, that and, and I think the bigger thing is just that the, the understanding of, of the return on cost, because if it's not there, that's kind of like, you know, the, 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 the factor that makes all deals equivalent. Right. And, it's like, hey, and am, so I, there, am I, it's literally return on cost. Is all the costs that I'm going to go into this right. going to give me a return that I need for me and my investors to make this project move forward? If that's 5%, I can't do it. Or if it's 6%, I can't do it. If it's 6.5%, I can. Yeah, 6.5% is kind of like that, <laughs> yeah. that like go and no go zone. Yeah. Um, Something and, I want to touch on. So from the lender perspective, I know like even Bercadia is doing a lot of work with like trying to talk to the agencies, Fannie and Freddie, to the help agencies, them. The agencies are in active discussions right now with a lot of clients on getting them comfortable with uh, the tax exemption, like I said, we submitted all these applications at the end of the year. Uh, the certifications just came out last week. They're being communicated from by Florida Housing. They're being communicated now to the property appraiser's office. The property appraiser just, you know, uh, we had com communications. There's a, there's a draft application that we're already working on. They I don't, I, they, if they publish it, they publish it today. Uh, but at least I have a draft version that I've disseminated to uh, from all the different property appraisers that disseminated so that we start, then we, then we submit the same package to uh, the local property appraiser's office. Right. So something I want to touch on is I think end of last year, um, this also applies to properties that were built within the last five years. Right. So to my understanding, if your property was built within the last five years, you can go and submit sort of retroactively if you qualify for these AMI restrictions and the income restrictions, and you'll get these tax savings, you know, starting in 2024. Correct. It'll, it'll let you, uh, Qualify retroactively, but it won't give you the money retroactively. Right. So yeah. you'll qualify as newly constructed, which is the in quotes is what the uh, law says, and um, and then you can start going forward. And and SB three twenty eight, by the way, takes into account um, that if you apply on December thirty first for twenty twenty three for your twenty twenty four tax um, bill, this new law is being passed now. It's retroactive to those applications. So the people that applied as of December 31st last year, are they going to get the benefit of uh, the new- Starting in 2024, you're the, saying? Starting this if year- If I'm a SB property 20. owner and I'm just finding out about this now, could I still submit for 2024? No, you'll savings? submit, they'll reopen towards the end of the year and you'll submit for- The application. 25, yeah. So you need to be, you need to be stabilized. You need the, the heads in the bed. Now you get the heads in the beds as of January 1st, so you can apply on the 31st. That head has to be in the bed by uh, on, on January 1st. If you have a vacancy, it doesn't qualify your first time around. For your future years, those vacancies do get, there's a methodology to deal with the vacancy. They'll, they'll let you still qualify. So if you drop under 71, just because you have a vacancy, they're not going to kick you out of the program. The tax exemption is good until 2059. Okay. It's decades from now. Yeah. And, uh, but you have to apply before the end of 2033. The bill sunsets, the law sunsets in 2033. 
zoning, taxes, financing, but you can still get the benefits of the taxes until 2059. So let's say a client of mine um, submitted for this December of 2023. Now or recently or in the future, they're going to get 2024 tax savings, but those are going to run through 2059, you're saying? As long as they maintain the qualification, they'll run through 2059. If I go and then sell that property, does that property for sure have to continue running through 2059 as a, you know? No, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't have to. So the way it works is you, you as the owner of the property owner commit yourself to a three-year period of time. You submit the package, uh, the market rate study. Uh, you have an affidavit that is included in, in that application. And the affidavit is that you're going to rent at these numbers and to these income restrictions for a period of three years. Three years finish. You know what? Market rents have, have moved way too much. I want out of the program. I'm going to go to a market rent number. Okay, no harm, no foul. You get to keep the tax exemption for those three years. You, know, you go your way and, and we go ours. If you want out before the three-year period, they've told us, yeah, you're going to have to, through Q&A, that you know, they're going to have to get reimbursed. They're going to have to get that money back so that you if, were exempted. If I'm selling a property where the NOI has gone from $3 million to $3.5 million because of the tax savings, that buyer basically says, okay, I can feel comfortable that we're going to have these tax savings through 2059 as long as we continue falling under these parameters. And if I, if the, if the math doesn't make sense anymore, looking at it from a math perspective, to not continue making yeah, these out. workforce, these units work for us, you could opt out and then have that transition where you're, you're saying the market rate rents, you know, will boost my NOI more right. than the tax savings. I mean, look, if, if you want to get hyper-technical about it, uh, Florida Housing puts out their um, kind of uh, guidance in Q&As and workshops. Some comes from... Uh, conferring with the Florida Department of Revenue through the property appraiser's office. There are 57 different property appraisers. So ultimately, they're, they're going to be the, the, the final line of interpretation. Um, you know, there's, there's nothing that prohibits a buyer from taking over the tax exemption. And um, it like runs with the property. Co correct. And, and so to the extent that there's a complication there, you know, we're, we're actually having those conversations with Florida Housing now. But I think it was just very fast on, and you, you can, you know, probably we'll do it where we take over the entity and it's only been around for a short period of time and, and it's an SPE and, and there are ways to deal with that. But lenders are getting increasingly comfortable with it. And at the end of the day, it's a debt service coverage ratio question, right? If you get out of the program, they're lending you money for over a five year period and the program's only for three years. Well, you can sign a covenant that you'll stay in the program unless it's accretive to the cash flow, right? And then you can opt out and you just got to maintain the debt service coverage ratio, just like anything else. Like if, you're, if, if your insurance goes up, which we saw happen, or if your taxes go up, it's the same thing. You just got to comply with their covenants and you'll agree to it privately with, with the lender and, and you'll be fine. Something I want to talk about is the 71 units and then projects that only put a percentage of their units into this pool. So I guess let me ask it as an example and you tell me where I'm wrong and, 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 and how I'm thinking about this. I own a 300 unit property, right? I need to at least qualify 71 units into a portion of either 120 or below 80% of AMI, right? To get these tax savings, right? Yeah, I mean, that, that's the uh, prevailing interpretation right now. There are some more inventive interpretations that are, well, you just need a 71 unit building at least. And then any units you qualify, qualify you. So if you had at least 71 units and then you put 20 units in the program, then you can qualify 20 units. I don't want to disagree with that. That was been floated around in some of the workshops and Q and A's, but it, uh, I didn't have any, what, any deals like that. Why would someone with a 300 unit building want to qualify 150 units as opposed to 300 units if the math is accretive? It just depends on the unit size. It's easier. Remember the, the, the Florida housing number is a, a chunk rent number. Okay. What they want to see is that you have this many bedrooms, uh, this many people in the household, this is your rent and this is your income limit. So it really, the size creates affordability also, okay? Um, and we'll get into parking requirements also. So another big change in SB 328 is the parking requirements. You're getting a lot of parking relaxation in there because uh, size of unit creates affordability. The number of parking spaces you need creates affordability. It's, it's not unique for me to have a project that I approve or that, that, that goes forward and 55% of the square footage in the project 
are parking spaces. And 45% of it is actually habitable space. I mean, think of that. You know, nobody- Parking <laughs> units. <laughs> so that everybody hates, everybody hates mass, right? Everybody on the neighbors hate mass and scale. But it's this like praying at the altar of the automobile, right? Oh, the almighty automobile, which We is, did a study where it was like a parking ratio, like user, like how much people actually used it. And it went from like, you know, 2.0 to 1.8 to 1.3. So it keeps getting lower and lower. And I mean, now, especially with all the people from New York and stuff that are yeah. moving down here, they just don't have cars. They've got the Brightline, they've got Uber, they've got Lyft. But, but the, for, for people in the, for uh, renters in the workforce housing bands, their number one expense in their household is, um, a community? Is, 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 no, is, is their rent. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay. Right. And the second largest household expense is transportation. And it doesn't matter who you are or, or, or how you look at it or slice it and dice it. Even if you say, oh, I'm just going to buy a $20,000 inexpensive car. Okay, well, now you got to borrow at 8 or 9% that loan. You also have to insure it and you pay gas. And the car breaks or whatever. And the car breaks. Yeah. And so there's, there's just this, we're at like a, a tipping point between psychologically people that, you know, are, are Gen X or millennials and, um, and then younger generation. What do you call younger generations? Gen Z. Gen Z. All right. Yeah. Gen Z, right. I was born in seven. I was born in the late seventies. Uh, you're probably, so I'm a Gen, I'm a Gen uh, X, you're a millennial, oh, maybe yeah, yeah, might be screwing this all up. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> so let, let's go back to Anthony's specialty, which is the live local act. Um, so talk to me real quick about the unit sizes. Yeah. Um, so if I have generally speaking, broad, broad strokes, if I have larger units, it's less accretive for me to You'll work if, through this. If your units are the largest in the market, chances are you're going to have a hard time. You're going to have a harder time qualifying for the tax exemption, even if you're under 120, because you got to do this 90% of your market rate study. And so the size of the unit will play play into the fact right. because of the way because of the way Florida housing interprets. Again, without you know giving away every single. Uh, nugget here, and it's just way too much detail. <laughs> They'll call you for the nuggets. Yeah, well, there's just way too much. The way that Florida Housing puts out their guidance and interpretation, it's, 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 it makes it more difficult when you have the largest units in the market. Well, for me, right, we've seen we've seen a trend in developments where they've gotten smaller and smaller just to make the rent per square foot numbers, you know, larger and larger. And I think my understanding is like if you've got a thousand square foot one bedroom, right, renting at way you too know, big. Yeah. it's a huge one bedroom at three thousand dollars but you've got a 550 square foot one bedroom renting at you know two thousand yeah twenty three hundred dollars like that might it may, may it may make more sense to do more of those and i think we've seen that trend where units have gotten smaller and smaller um my understanding of all this is that on those smaller units they'll be easier to qualify for the ami thresholds right no no a hundred percent and and so look but it's all market driven at the end of the day. You're not going to get a unit that's too small to, to actually, uh, you know, get the sales you need, right? You get the, get the rents that you want. Um, it's limited by the uh, size of units by the local jurisdiction. Like I said, you still have to comply with the local land development rules. So whatever the minimum size requirements are, you still have to uh, comply with those minimum size requirements. But yes, it's, it's affordability. And, you know, what does that allow you to do? The smaller unit lets you get in more infill closer people want to live, uh, lets you create a more amenitized product, sometimes furnish the product. Do you know how much it costs? I don't know if you've been to West Elm lately, buddy, but you <laughs> yeah, know, furnishing is not cheap. You can easily get $500 for a chair and that's yeah. not exactly going to last too long. I yeah. mean, and uh, I don't know about Ikea, but it's probably like creeping up on that. Um, and, 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 and so you're getting closer to the best opportunities for employment. Also, the more info you get, the more clo the closer you are to Brickell downtown, all these different areas where the best sources of employment are and that are the best career um, opportunities as well. And then when you're in those areas, hopefully you, you know, you can be in a TOD, a transit oriented development overlay area. And now with SB 328, there's no parking requirement. So How do you qualify for no parking requirements or like more, more is, lax parking requirements? Is G, well, the, traditionally it's, it's, it's always been geographic. Right. Predicated off of your proximity to uh, public transit, whether it's heavy rail, light rail, uh, transit uh, through bus, trolley, I mean, shuttle service, micro mobility. If you're near public transit, 
you could have less parking or no parking. Correct. My now mobility. 328 says what? Now it says, now it says if you're in a TOD area, a trans-oriented development area, which municipalities have designated, then you don't have to park at all. It's all demand-based parking. So you as a developer can make a decision and say, I'm going to build this product. And I mean, this exists in other towns. I mean, this is nothing new. Uh, I have clients that build in Tampa that zero park to buildings or clients that are from LA or Austin that zero park to buildings. We are, the curve is moving more and more and more to doing away with parking restrictions um, because of affordability and, and, and because of, of, of the push towards more infill development. And so that there's less mass in the buildings, you get closer to where you want to be. And, you know, we can build in areas and there's tons of innovation, by the way, tons of innovative solutions or transportation wallets that tenants get in these buildings that can use as credits. And, and our, our, our parking rules go back. If you think about Miami 21, for example, Miami 21 is over a decade old now. So what did the world look like a decade ago? And when we started debating, I think I was a, a law clerk in the city of Miami at the time in the legal department. And we were working on implementing and drafting Miami 21. I mean, that's this going back even almost a decade before that. And so these, these things are, are retroactively looking back two decades. But today we have what happened? Oh, we had COVID. We have work from home. We had Uber. We have micro mobility. We have Gen, These Gen Z that has, you know, they don't care about driving cars. Yeah. And so well, I'm all, millennial, but you've got Gen Z. All right. Yeah. I'm sorry. I pointed yeah, out. So I'll, know, give, yeah, I'll give you some Gen <laughs> Z credit. Um, so, you know, the world moving forward looks completely different than when these laws were passed. And we have to be em embracing of that in particular in areas where you're not close to a single family residential area. I can understand. That's why they went and live local and SB 328 and they enhanced, you know, that component of it. They created more protections for single family areas. And I can get on board with that hundred percent. But if we're in an infill TOD area, the stuff that I love, if you're putting people right next to Brickell, thing just west of the river, Little Havana, or just outside, um, you know, downtown or Brickell, um, you know, parts of Wimwood, uh, or might be a little bit outside of that, but we got to expand it. We, we got to expand the transit corridor areas. I, my rule of thumb is if you're, if you're, if you're public transit headway, which means the frequency of the stop is 60 minutes or less, then you can use it. You can use it because that means you can go there at, at six in the morning, seven in the morning, eight in the morning. You can supplement with trolley service. Smaller municipalities are using trolley service. Doral uses it. Tamarack uses it. Coral Gables uses it. I mean, so I can go on down the list. I, I guess two, two questions and then we'll start wrapping up. One is how are you seeing it statewide? Are you seeing a lot more of this being applied to South Florida and applicable to South Florida versus Jacksonville? Or are you sort of seeing it across no, the board? Everywhere. 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 Because it's of the Everywhere. county AMI, so it just, the affordability is across the county. Everywhere. Across, floor, across Everywhere. Florida. So I'm seeing it at um, Garden Style product, and I'm seeing it at Mid-Rise product. Okay, 75 foot, after 75 feet, there are additional Florida building code costs, vertical transportation, fire suppression, life safety issues you have to deal with. So I would say Mid-Rise on down, statewide. High-Rise, it's a whole other ballgame. Only in limited areas where you can really get the, um, where, the, where the, the units are really accretive on the market rate to get the, the bump of the market rate units. And we can help figure out how to build a pro forma around the workforce units. Um, does it make sense? In those areas, I would, I would, but like a city of Miami, like Wynwood's a perfect example of that. But outside of those specific areas, you're not seeing high rise. That's why people say, oh, live local, they're all scared of it. And, and there's some pushback by, uh, you know, I guess about half a people dozen. People don't really, yeah. yeah it's, it's a fear of the unknown. Yeah. You're not going to see that. It's impossible to see this, this picture in their mind of a high rise next to a single family home. It's just not going to happen. Um, you know, you're seeing more uh, garden style and more um, uh, mid rise. And, and then, I see it for me, like I'm selling a piece of land and then now there's a whole live local act sort of financial angle to look at it under to see if it makes more sense. Right. A seller comes to me and says, hey, I want to sell my land. Right. What's it worth? And I'll say, I don't know, around five million dollars. But now I look at this live local angle where I can get tax savings without lowering the rents too much. And now it's a seven million dollar piece of land, right? Like this, the residual land value. And now they're like more excited. And I'm not saying it works across the board, but there are in some cases where it does work. So I'm glad you're seeing it Florida wide and not just like Miami or South Florida. That's amazing. And then two, 
Is there a component about this as it relates to like value add and 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 how, how's that? Yeah. So <laughs> so let me just your your other question about the added value. I mean, look at the end of the day, we're still working with municipalities on this stuff. I mean, this is real time that we're rolling this out. It's the law in a vacuum. It's the law is implemented jurisdiction wide, and then it gets down to the nitty gritty of the actual property. Okay. Until you get that last piece, and until you have a site plan approval, nothing's guaranteed. So you can't say, oh, my property's worth X amount of dollars. Yeah, fine. But you look, maybe there's something to be said if, if a certain approval's had, right? But it's, 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 none of that is accretive and you don't, I think, to, to, uh, until it, it actually manifests itself. And the taxes as well. I can't guarantee, you know, you're, you're, you, I know that people love to sell the dream, so to speak, but you can't, there, there is no, the dream is not reality until you've built it, you stabilize it, you have your market rate study, and you have actual heads in the beds that you're renting out and you get a tax exemption back. And, whether or not, like in the city of Miami, right, let's take the city of Miami, for example. If you qualify for live local and industrial, industrial, commercial, or mixed use, you can do a thousand units an acre. Yeah. Does that mean you can actually build a thousand no, units an acre? I get, yeah. <laughs> We're not building on the moon where the gravity is seven times less than Earth, okay? There are restrictions and there's FAA and, and, and there's, you know, you're, you're, you're limiting the, the rent on the product to begin with. So there's definitely an, an interchange there, but it gives you the flexibility to build what the market will bear is I think the, the best takeaway for it, what the market will bear. And then value add. value add. If you can go high, this is a whole nother high level, level high level yeah. value add. Okay. One of the first amendments of S uh, 328 had a definition in it called substantial rehabilitation. Right. And basically it was a statutory definition of 40% of your unit value, not your taking out your land, taking out the common area, 40% of the unit value. If you hit that number in terms of uh, value add in, uh, improvement to the unit, to the property, then you hit substantial rehabilitation and you qualify for the tax exemption. Okay, it didn't make it, it got pulled out of subsequent uh, amendments to SB328, uh, so it's out. Some people say, well, that's a good thing because I can't do 40%. Some people say well, that's a bad thing because I was gonna convert, uh, there are, there's a lot of Central Florida work converting um, you know, motels or uh, extended stays into multifamily affordable housing. And that would have done really well there, uh, but they pulled the substantial rehab definition out. So it's and no so, longer in place? No, but there's this gray area now and there are 57 property appraisers and each one might have a different interpretation about it because there's no definition to newly constructed either for the tax exemption. Interestingly enough, there's another component of the Live Local bill that gives you sales tax reimbursements for your construction materials, but at, at lower thresholds at, um, at like less than 80%, not at 120 in that portion, they say newly constructed does not include rehabilitation, modification, et cetera, et cetera. But in the tax exemption for us, for the 120, guess what newly constructed doesn't include? It doesn't include that. So if you, if you go by the principles of legislative drafting, the, ex- the inclusion in one means that it doesn't apply to the other if you don't include it. So to be, con- it to be angle. continued... Right. Because some PAs have said, great argument, sorry, it's not gonna fly in this jurisdiction. Other PAs were still in active discussions with them about that particular product type to see if it works or not. But I think before we wrap this up, I, I wanna get into kind of the nitty gritty people have put up with me, my soapbox, my policy arguments. So let me just tell you like real quick, uh, SB 328 versus SB 102. So SB 102 comes out to qualify, for the zoning, you need 40% of your residential units at the 120 AMI. 65% of your project, um, as little as 65% of your project can be residential, and as much as 35% of your project can be non-residential. So you can do full mixed use, okay? But you gotta do 40% at 120 AMI. Now, that being said, let's fast forward to SP328. SP102 got you a new max density, so you get the max density within the jurisdiction you're in, whether it's the county or the city. You get the max height within a mile in the county or the city. You can't go across city or county lines. And you got an administrative approval of that. We quickly found out that we got units, we got height, we ran out of square footage. So now SP328 preempts square footage. And it says 100, you get 
of the, of the local jurisdiction's highest FAR. So if your highest FAR is four, you're actually going to get six now, which is 150%. Wow. So that, that's, that's probably one of the biggest changes that happened in SB um, 328. Um, the other thing is parking in TODs. So like I said, you're going to get no parking in a TOD. Within um, half a mile of a transit hub, you're going to get a 20% reduction in parking. And now we have, you know, once it passes the Senate, it goes to the House. So it's in its last committee in the House today. It's, as we started this, this interview, it was still going on. It might be done. I don't know. But yesterday at um, 2.45 or something like that, they dropped a new amendment in the committee and the House expanded on some of the concepts. And it, and it proposed a 20% reduction, not just a half a mile but transit hub, from transit hubs, but also a, half a, a quarter mile from transit stops. Mm-hmm. So we had bus that wanted to give you the parking reductions. Unfortunately, that also bleeded into seven o'clock at night in my house. And it was my, my 13th anniversary yesterday with my wife. Congratulations. And she said, oh, thank you. Uh, she's sitting there waiting to go out to dinner. And she goes, what happened? Live local? Something in Tallahassee again? And I'm like, listen, I'm getting fired these questions from our lobbyists. And they're literally going back and forth. And we're trying to get it put in before the committee. Yeah, my, my wife is like, oh, what is it? It's in committee, right? It's in committee tomorrow. So you got to get the amendment done right now. And if not, it has to go to the floor. I go, yes, exactly. She goes, all right, you got until 730. So we thank your wife for the 13 years that you've been married. No. So, so sorry, back, back to the SB 328. So then well, one thing we got pulled out is rental. So it said within a multifamily rental development. So that rental word was hanging up a lot of jurisdictions saying you can't do for sale product for your market rate units. It can only be full rental. So that word at, I think it was line 140, 141, SB 102, gone. Now we can do for sale product. Some city members are letting us do for sale so product. So basically now you can do for sale product. Mixed income for parking, sale. With less parking. Correct. Because that word rental was removed. Yeah. If you want to do layer upon layer in a TOD, now you can do for sale product within your market rate units. So now you're creating great mixed income product all over the place not just a full rental um, development project. Um, I talked to you about single family protections. So you got to keep in mind, the city of Miami is, or the county, we're big, we're, we're, we're the bigger jurisdictions, but there's some towns that, you know, barely have townhouses, okay? Or they're small and they're only 12 blocks and they're only two square miles. So you get a lot of stuff that goes on in, 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 in a tight proximity to a single family neighborhood. And so, well, while the, the, the instances of this were a lot less than they thought, so the, the, the fear was greater than the reality, I think it's warning and it gives them the, the comfort they need. So now there's a protection where the height stays, you still pull from a mile away for your height, unless you're adjacent to a single family zone neighborhood. If you're adjacent to a single family zone neighborhood, you get three stories, whatever your zoning allows in your site, or... 150% of the tallest height that's adjacent to you. So if you have single family on one side, you have a four-story building on another side, then you're gonna get 150% of that four-story building, six stories. Nothing 80-story, high rise. So they're, they're controlling that and we, 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 we worked on that definition of adjacency because every jurisdiction is different. Some don't even have that definition. So adjacent doesn't count across the street. So think about your corridors, your coral ways, your bird roads. Those are still going to be applicable to the full height, but it does protect instances where you have, you know, you're touching your property line with a single family neighborhood and you're truly in this single family zoned area. Um, and we wanted to create those additional protections. The original SP 328 said a quarter mile for everything. Everyone. I know. It's just, so it's, it doesn't I've make got, sense. I've got two uh, ways that I want to wrap this up. Two things I want to do. One is when you got here, you took a call and jotted down some notes. Oh, so yeah. I want to make sure you got through. You, we can talk about the the live notes of what's happened, yeah, latest and greatest as out, of today. Scratch out everything that I covered. You've covered. So we'll do the notes, and then the last thing I want to wrap up with is, you know, the shortcuts of Live Local Act. I don't know, maybe shortcuts is a bad word, but the. The ways in which you say, hey, I'm looking for this type of place and this type of project to get the most value creation for for everyone involved, right? Like there's things that you now look at and you're like, oh, this is a place where it might work. This is what we're looking for. What are some of those um, 
you know, uh, how can I say it? Like the more you read into it, the more you understand where it applies best and where it doesn't. But let's go through the notes first and then we'll finish up with where it applies best and where it doesn't. All right, so SB 328 turned into House Bill 1239. So the House has three committees it goes through before it votes. It went through two committees. It has, it's in the third committee today. And they proffered yesterday on President's Day when nobody was working in theory, uh, a, a new amendment. And that amendment proposed additional enhancements. Number one, that um, max lot area also be preempted. Mm -hmm. So we still have setbacks. When you say preempted. Preempted means the state will dictate a certain new maximum. Remember I talked about preemption. So they preempt <clears throat> unit density, they preempt height, they preempt FAR now, and the House is proposing a preemption on max lot area so that you get, you can avail yourself of the, uh, the, the, the largest percentage of, of lot area that the city permits while still complying with the setback restrictions. So you can have a, a larger building footprint, so it makes the construction more affordable. Um, SB 328 says you can do Industrial, and this is SB 102 also, industrial, commercial, or mixed use. Now, House Bill 1239 says any government-owned piece of property to further facilitate P3s. Mm -hmm. And we do a lot of P3s a in the office. Of these, yeah. Okay? And public-private partnerships. Public-private public partnerships. And this is the beauty, a little nugget. At 120 AMI, you can do an unsolicited proposal and get a non-competitive award by an up and straight up and down vote by the elected body. I'm laughing because one of like the best people that could uh, create value in knowing this is like, I got this little nugget, nobody knows about it, but here's, you know, for the people. Oh, I, I let the secret out? You can edit that out later so, if you want. I'm so happy about that. There you go. Right, you can edit it out if you want. So now they want to, now they want to make it. Now they want to make it, uh, now they automatically want to make any government owned site falls into those um, categories. Um, we talked about the additional zoning, uh, parking uh, relaxation. So they want 20% off within a quarter mile of any transit stop. So in SB 328, the last thing is the one thing that, that, that we, we got lobbied against uh, by the general counsel, I think it's the Florida Aviation uh, uh, Council, was that they wanted protections around airports. Because the airports, they, I would, I would say for the most part, and they wouldn't disagree with this, that the airports view the areas around an airport as kind of their domain. And they want supportive industrial facilities around um, airports, not residential. We have noise. We have other, these other considerations. And so there was a heavy, <clears throat> there was a heavy lobby in 328 to establish a 10,000 foot radius from each point of each runway where you couldn't do a live local project. But think about that maybe international airport. I'm going to tell you something. We are seven miles between the alligators and the sharks in Biscayne Bay. Yeah, and the airport's in the middle. And so when you take out probably like five miles out of that, and guess who works at the airport? A lot of workforce housing tenants work by the airport. So we, there was a lot of negotiation on that, and they, 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 they paired it back to a runway, uh, basically a quarter mile out from the runway, and then lengthwise you add 10,000 feet. So it became a, a flight path and a noise contour restriction against live local, but it applied to every single airport. They didn't qualify it. And I went back and, and it was too late at that point in time. But I went back and I said, look, there's a definition for a commercial service airport in Florida statute. Why don't you limit it just to commercial service airports? So the house bill 1239 now comes back and says limited to commercial service airports, which means 10,000 um, flights a year instead of your executive airport. So Opelika would be, would be allowed to have live local projects. Think about all the ones we have. We have Miami International that would be in still, but out would be Opelika, uh, 10 Miami, and Homestead Air, and Homestead, not Homestead Airport, but Homestead has a local airport as well. And so the funny thing is in recognition of that, Commissioner Realado at the county level just put in committee a new workforce housing bill, a new workforce housing ordinance proposed for Miami-Dade County that says explicitly they want to build more workforce housing up to 140% AMI around airports. So she knows, and I mean, she's really, I mean, she's really a proponent of workforce housing. She sees it and she says, wait a second. And this is by sheer coincidence, I think. I don't think none of this was planned, but she knows all these people that are the airport or hospitality employees, they're definitely these workforce housing bans. And, and it's an incredible employment source that they need to be close to because of transit restrictions. So those are the big things. 
um, that happened I'm, in the house bill. I mean, you're I'm literally jotting this down <laughs> from, from I'm getting texts. I got a, I got a text from shout out to uh, my colleague, Nick Noto in the office. Who's texting me like, whoa, WH, you know, like exclamation point and big eyeballs as he's sending me screenshots of stuff that are coming out of this committee. So we'll have to do a follow up. We'll have to do a follow up when, when it all gets said and done. But I think in the next like week or two, this will be finished. If in fact the House adopts these proposed changes out of committee, the Senate president gets it back and says, okay, we'll accept this and we'll vote on it. Or they can kick it back to the House and say, you know, we're not going to do that. Oh, so right now I just got text. This is like no joke. Shout out to Nick uh, Erosi and Karen Flynn over at Capital City uh, Consulting, who are uh, part of our lobbyist team over there. All amendments were adopted to the bill and it passed with only one no vote in the um, committee. So now it's going to go to the House floor um, with all those different enhancements that I mentioned to you. It's amazing. So I can't make this. I literally can't. I got the alert on my phone. I was like, so they'll, they'll pass it on the floor of the house. I'm I, very likely in almost unanimous fashion. I will, I will reiterate. This is not a bi, uh, uh, this is not a partisan bill. This is hundred percent bipartisan got passed practically unanimously the first time. This is not a DeSantis thing. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, Senator Osgood who proposed the parking relaxations. She's a Democrat. Okay. She knew, and I watched the debate on the floor. She said flat out, parking is killing affordability and we need to have people building projects close to transit. The Senate sponsors are Republican. So they are working together. I mean, this is what you need. I think everyone from both sides of the aisle no, are, looking it's at, perfect. are tackling the unaffordability crisis head on. Listen, if we don't solve the affordability crisis, this is our state's affordability. This is our uh, Achilles heel. Florida became the 15th largest economy in the world by GDP. We are on track to become the 10th largest economy by 2030. These are numbers from Florida Chamber that I'm involved in. I love this stuff. I'm a data nerd. It can be the 10th largest economy by 2030. The only thing that can prevent that from happening is this affordability problem. We just passed New York last year for jobs, number of jobs. We passed New York for population. But with all this success comes a strain on infrastructure. And we need to be all in the kitchen sink, Every single possible and we're option. Tackling it, we're tackling it head on. I, what I love about this is it's bipartisan. So basically, like no matter what nobody your can views complain. Are, when you see when you see a headline, affordability. if you see a headline in the New York Times, uh, Washington, uh, uh, the, the, the Wall Street Journal, which are picking up on these things for the first time, if they say DeSantis bill, then you know there's an angle to that because this is completely bipartisan. This is not a DeSantis bill, but we the the the, the economic argument for this is you need to bring in your young professionals back to Miami. Don't make them move away. But if they don't have that lifestyle, they're not in for the shoebox, New York subway. Uh, uh, yeah, there's plenty scenario. of stuff in between Florida and New York, but we want to keep it. In we got to bring them back. And yeah. then if we can't, my kids, this is a lot. And I want to make sure you put this in the podcast. Yeah. My kids go to public school because I'm adamant. I believe in the school they go to through their language programs. It's the best school in Miami-Dade County. Okay. And they're going to continue going to junior high for that. But the school board, the school districts are hemorrhaging teachers. And we are in active negotiating discussions right now and meetings with both Broward and Miami-Dade County school boards and their school board members about how we tackle this issue. And they have a lot of lands. So we got to figure out ways to house these teachers. And teachers are definitely in those bands. But we can't hemorrhage, we can't hemorrhage teachers. And we can't lose young professionals. This is gonna. This is the best shot that we have at keeping us moving this forward. This little post-it note right here. No, <laughs> if you want right. I mean, like, I can't. You want to zoom in? It's right, right. there. I mean, we're I, I, I cross here. things off as we as, as we as went through. We're so. coming. No, so you can tell both of us are super passionate about Florida. I get a lot of passion from seeing a bipartisan approach to solving the unaffordability crisis. That's why I'm. Very long Miami, but very long Florida. Um, and it's something that gets me fired up. So I'm sure we will have more conversations about this as it continues to evolve. But my quick pitch for Anthony DeYuri at Bilzen is if you own land, 
if you own multifamily, if you're looking to invest in land or multifamily, it merits a call to Anthony because he will likely be able to tell you pretty quickly if there are value accretive ways for you to be doing what it is you're looking to do in the state of Florida. Well, we'll separate the fact from fiction. I don't want to burst any property owner's bubbles, but it's not going to double the <laughs> value of their... He may deliver bad news, but it, it's worth a call. Well, it is I'll, worth a call. I'll find some levers What's that we the can best pull? way for people to reach you? People can reach me, um, Instagram, Miami Zoning Law. Uh, That's your reach, Instagram handle? Yeah, Miami, Miami Zoning, Zoning Law. Yep. Right, at Miami Zoning Law. I love it. At Miami Zoning Law, or just email me at the office, adyuri at bilson.com. Or type in Live Local and Anthony Diuri, and hopefully you'll find some, some article that I toiled that away after my long day of work in publishing where I think somebody might find it interesting. <laughs> Anthony, I can't thank you enough for the time. Awesome. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Take amazing. care.